I am James Bradley, and this is Untold Pacific, a podcast series which mines 40 years of my life in Asia and my four best-selling books to create historical travelogues about the American experience on the other side of the Pacific. This is James Bradley. I'm on a French cruise ship in the Pacific, somewhere between Taiwan and Okinawa. Today I'd like to talk about the morality of war. Imagine that you were a Japanese resident of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. You just got toasted by an atomic bomb. Your skin is black and festering. You would hate the pilot that dropped that atomic bomb. That pilot's name was Paul Tibbetts. I interviewed Mr. Tibbetts. I appeared a number of times on stages with him. I asked Mr. Tibbetts about the morality of dropping the atomic bomb. Mr. Tibbetts told me, Please try to understand this. It's not an easy thing to hear, but please listen. There is no morality in warfare. You kill children. You kill women. You kill old men. You don't seek them out, but they die. That's what happens in war. Folks, there's no morality in war. Anyone listening to this podcast who wants to figure out who was right and who was wrong, who had the moral side in World War II in the Pacific, I'm sorry. You came to the wrong place. You won't hear it from me. The veterans tell me there is no morality in war. In 1968, my older brother Steve was a Marine fighting in Vietnam. I remember back then, I was 14 years old, and I would help my mother pack care packages, which we mailed off to Steve. 47 years later, I ventured to the area in Vietnam where my brother had fought. I interviewed Vietnamese who were fighting against my own brother. One rainy day in Vietnam, about 4 p.m., I was in a taxi trying to find the home of a Vietnamese couple, a husband and wife who had fought against the Marines. It was a hard tropical rain. The windshield wipers were working furiously, but we could hardly see. The sun was going down. We went back and forth, up and down the highway, trying to find their home. Finally, we found the right place. The couple stood smiling in their doorway, welcoming me into their house. I walked in all wet. We went into the living room, and in the traditional Vietnamese manner, there were couches facing each other with a table in between. On the table, Mrs. T had prepared a spread of tea and biscuits, cookies and flowers and four types of fruit. It was enough for ten people, yet we were only three. Mrs. T said, Mr. Bradley, I prepared this for you. Please eat. I wasn't hungry, but I wanted to be polite. I sipped some tea, nibbled on a little cookie, and had half a banana, but I was eager to start the interview. Quickly, I learned that Mrs. T fought in more battles than Mr. T had, which was often the case in Vietnam. As we were deep into discussing about their fighting in the war, Mrs. T looked at me with a concern and said, Mr. Bradley, you're not eating anything. She opened a biscuit and handed it to me. She said, this is a special biscuit. I think you'll like this one. Soon I learned that Mrs. T had four American bullets still embedded in her spine. Mr. T told me, the doctors can't operate. It's too close to her spine. There'd be too much nerve damage. She's been this way since 1968. Before I could react to this news, Mrs. T peeled me an orange. Please eat, Mr. Bradley. The constant beat of the rain was so loud it was pounding on their metal roof. The sound of the rain was almost like a fourth person in the room. I thought for a second, and then I asked Mrs. T, Ma'am, am I the first American you've seen since that Marine shot you? She answered, Yes, Mr. Bradley, but, but, but look, you're not eating. Look at these bananas. They're local. They're sweet. I looked into her eyes and I said, Ma'am, how do you feel about Americans now? She said, 
oh, Ho Chi Minh told us not to hate the Americans. The Americans were victims of the U.S. government, just like we Vietnamese were victims of the U.S. government. We shared that. Uncle Ho told us, you have to shoot the Americans to get them to leave the country, but don't hate the Americans. Would you like some more tea, Mr. Bradley? These oranges really are so fresh. I asked, ma'am, how do those bullets in your spine feel right now? She said, well, sometimes I have migraines. Sometimes they hurt a lot. I get dizzy. I lost my sight a couple of times in my life. It hurts most when it's raining. Mr. Bradley, you're not eating anything. For a moment, I was lost in my own thought world. It was dominated by the sound of the rain on the roof. I'm looking at this kindly lady offering me an orange, and I got disoriented. It's hard to describe. Time stood still, then time warped. Then I thought of my own mother. I thought my mom would love Mrs. T. My mother would be embracing Mrs. T, crying for her. I wondered if I had helped my mother pack a care package for the Marine who put four bullets in Mrs. T's spine. I felt disoriented. I had to continue the interview. I I looked down at my questions and followed them, but I was floating between two realities. Soon we finished the interview. I packed up my things. Mr. and Mrs. T escorted me to the door as the rain continued to beat down. As I walked towards the door, Mrs. T put her two hands on my arm, patting it like a caring mother. As Mrs. T patted my arm, she said, Mr. Bradley, we didn't treat you well. You didn't eat anything. Why don't you bring your whole family next time and I'll cook for them? I said, yes, ma'am. Then I walked out into the pounding rain and let it wash away my tears. Westerners learned that in World War II, the Japanese had a crazy cult of suicide. We learned that Japanese soldiers were like traditional samurai who followed the suicidal code of Bushido. This is inaccurate. The truth is that Japanese soldiers in World War II were victims of the corruption of Bushido, the corruption of the traditional Japanese code. Samurai values represent the best in a Japanese person. These values are about honoring himself and his lord. A samurai would never commit suicide because he was losing a battle. They would commit ritual suicide to atone for dishonor, to cleanse the family name. But there was no tradition in the samurai code of Bushido for a samurai to kill himself if he was facing defeat. Now, in old Japan, there were very few samurai, the top class. Very few of these samurais ever committed suicide. The samurai around the Meiji Emperor in the 19th century were brilliant high-class guys. They constructed the modern Japanese state. In 1905, the Russo-Japanese War became a huge event in Japanese history. At that time, the Russo-Japanese War became to Japan like football is to Notre Dame. It was the first time in Japanese history that commoners were drafted and sent overseas as soldiers. The war with Russia saw huge, pre-modern, almost prehistoric battles. But this was a war that Japan could not win. The Russo-Japanese War was fought mostly in and around Korea. Japan never invaded Russia. Russia never invaded Japan. Japan could win some battles, but you have to factor in that the Russians were far from their European base. They were at the end of their supply line out there in Korea on a railroad that went on forever. And their battleships had to come all the way around the world for months to encounter the Japanese in Korean waters. The Japanese had kind of a hometown advantage and could win some battles, but Japan couldn't invade Russia and march to its capital and defeat the Russians. That was impossible. 
Japan won the Russo-Japanese War at the conference table. These very canny samurai who had built the Meiji Emperor brought in Theodore Roosevelt for negotiations, and Japan was allowed to declare victory over Russia, not on the battlefield, but at the conference table. The common soldiers, the common army guys who were out there slugging it out with the Russians, these lowly soldiers didn't understand that the war was won by samurai strategists at the conference table. These commoners didn't understand Japan's weaknesses. They looked at Japan's victory and thought, we won because of our blood and guts, because of Japanese spirit. We had the courage to allow 50,000 Japanese soldiers to die in that battle, and then 40,000 to die in that battle. We won the war against the Russians. In time, the canny samurai around Meiji passed, and soon the common soldiers from the glorious Russo-Japanese War came to control the Japanese military. And these guys had a crazy thought. They thought of how they could increase Japanese spirit. And what they did is they corrupted the idea of Bushido of killing yourself for honor. And they told the new draftees that it was inevitable that they were going to die in battle and they shouldn't worry about their own death. They should embrace the Japanese spirit and be ready to die. This was not the samurai way. This was a corruption of Bushido. In the Russo-Japanese War under the Meiji Emperor, many Japanese soldiers had surrendered. They served as POWs, and then they came back as heroes to Japan. There was no problem about surrendering. But the new Imperial Japanese Army masters, these Suedo samurai, these former common soldiers, erased that history. Now they focused on the base blood and guts of death. The Imperial Japanese Criminal Code of 1908 announced, A commander who allows his unit to surrender to the enemy without fighting to the last man shall be punished by death. Do not be taken prisoner alive. This was brand new thinking. This wasn't about samurai values. This was a new soldier system. Bushido corrupted. These Japanese kids, these new draftees, entered an army that was actually a feudal slave system. There were two distinct strata. On the top, where the officers were, and they lived like God's privileged imperial officials. The recruits were trained that they were lowly, that they were worth nothing, and that they should be ready to die in battle for the emperor. The new draftees entered a violent asylum where they were pummeled, slapped, kicked, and beaten daily. Mr. Watanabe told me, For 40-something years now, I've suffered ringing in my ears. This is the after-effect of severe beatings when I was a draftee. New recruits and draftees were beaten for no reason. The members of the military were ignorant and they had lost their humanity. They thought that beatings were a form of education. Mr. Ito told me, During my first year, my head was beaten with green bamboo poles and my face was slapped with leather slippers. This changed the shape of my face. I wonder what my parents would have felt had they seen me in this state. Soldiers had to have absolute, unhesitating, unthinking, blind obedience to orders. Soldiers were to regard the orders of their superiors as coming directly from the emperor. Folks, think of what that means. Officers' orders were infallible. They were absolutely unconditional. The new Japanese soldiers had no concept of legal or illegal orders. They were taught only to listen and to obey. In the course of writing my books, I interviewed Japanese soldiers who had cut off the heads of Americans. In each case, they'd be ordered to do it by their superior. They would object to their superior. Not me. I don't want to do it. 
the superior would say something to the effect, fine, then we'll kill you. There was no choice for the guy who was ordered to do it. He had to rationalize to himself, well, I guess the emperor needs this American dead. In the aftermath of World War II, we charged these soldiers legally in trials with concepts like, you had the responsibility to disobey illegal orders. The Japanese soldiers would scratch their heads. Responsibility? I was taught that my superiors had the responsibility. I had no responsibility. Just a minute. Disobey? Well, what do you Americans mean by disobeying an order? I had the responsibility to disobey an order? You're charging me with, excuse me, what's an illegal order? As Mr. Saka told me, we learned that senior soldiers were gods. My brother, Steve Bradley, who in 1968 might have shot Mrs. T, was not immoral. He was following his Marine training. In boot camp, silhouettes popped up that looked like Vietnamese. He was trained to shoot these wooden silhouettes representing Vietnamese people. Then later when he got to Vietnam, maybe Mrs. T just popped up and he shot her. Japanese World War II soldiers were not crazy. They were following their code, a new non-samurai code. The lazy desk generals back in Tokyo invented euphemisms to glorify the army's defeats. These aren't defeats, they said. These are gyokusai. The soldiers were gyokusai. Gyokusai means shattered jewels. It comes from a Chinese tale where a man, rather than dishonor himself, threw his jewels down, shattered them on the ground. So now the Japanese army generals said that defeats were just shattered jewels. And the Japanese soldiers caught in the gulags were shattered jewels themselves. How honorable. Let's go back to the Battle of Tarawa, November 1943. 99.7% of the Japanese followed their code and died. On the next island over from Tarawa, Macon Island, one out of 300 Japanese survived. February 1944, the island of Roy Namor. There were 3,500 Japanese on that island. 51 were captured. The fatality rate was 98.5%. They followed their code. On Kwajalein, there were 5,000 Japanese defenders. 79 were taken prisoner. The fatality rate was 98.4%. These guys were following their code. The lazy Tokyo desk generals who had bastardized Bushido now informed the dead soldiers' families, Congratulations! Your son has just gyokusai'd. Your son is an honorable, shattered jewel. When I was writing my second book, Flyboys, I had a rock in my bathroom that I would look at every morning. It was a rock from Marpy Point in Saipan, an island 1,500 miles south of Tokyo. Marpy Point is a high cliff on Saipan, about 200 yards high. It's windy up there. You look down into the ocean, and it's very dramatic and scary. Big rocks are down there with the ocean slamming against it. You fall off that cliff, and you have no chance of survival. In World War II, there were 20,000 Japanese civilians on Saipan. The Tokyo Desk General sent a message on June 24, 1944, to the commanders of Saipan. Quote, The Saipan Defense Force should carry out gyokusai. In other words, Tokyo was saying, All you guys on Saipan are going to die. You're all going to be shattered jewels. So the three Japanese commanders read the gyokusai order. They ordered a final assault by their troops. Then the three commanders killed themselves. How does the suicide of the three top commanders help the Japanese war effort? 
These weren't samurai. This wasn't Bushido. True Japanese samurai would have agreed with the U.S. Army General George Patton. No one ever won a war by dying for their country. They won by making the other son of a bitch die for his. Some Japanese soldiers on Saipan were armed with only bayonets lashed to bamboo sticks. They charged the U.S. Marines, screaming, Banzai! One Marine remembered, These Japanese just kept coming and coming, and it didn't stop. It didn't make any difference. If you shot one or five or more, somebody else would take their place. To the civilians living on Saipan, Tokyo said, You will have glorious Gyokusai together. You will become a shattered jewel. At Marpy Point, this beautiful cliff on Saipan, the Marines watched dumbfounded as mothers tossed their babies off that cliff and then jumped to their own deaths. The Marines took megaphones out and shouted, Surrender! Don't jump! You'll be given food, water, and safety. You won't be harmed. Surrender. Japanese fathers, mothers, and children listened to the Marines' surrender instructions, and then they jumped off the cliff holding each other. Fathers slit their children's throats and tossed their bodies over that cliff. Three women meticulously brushed their hair, adjusted their clothes, and then jumped. Newspapers in New York said, This is crazy. Newspapers in Tokyo said, this is heroic. If an average Japanese citizen had stood in the center of Tokyo and called the Saipan actions of the Japanese civilians crazy, they probably would have been arrested. If an average American citizen stood in the center of New York and called them heroic, they'd probably be arrested. This was World War II. On the island of Iwo Jima, there were 22,000 Japanese soldiers in the stinking underground. Their superior had helpfully posted a notice in each one of the underground killing rooms. And the notice said, Kill 10 Americans before you die. 22,000 Japanese soldiers knew they were going to die. Traditional Japanese samurai values, Bushido values, were very motivational. They were about honor. But this corrupted World War II version of Bushido was demotivational. It's a downer when you know you're going to die. On February 19, 1945, my father, John Bradley, landed with thousands of other Marines on the sands of Iwo Jima. The Battle of Iwo Jima still stands as the worst battle in the history of the United States Marine Corps. On February 23rd, my father and 22 American boys tentatively made their way up the island's high point, Mount Suribachi. They put up the first flag. Don Howell, a Marine who was there, who was later awarded the Navy Cross, a real Marine hero friend of my father, later told me this. After the first flag raising, we were scouting quietly with our rifles ready. Suddenly a Japanese emerged from a cave. He had a rifle in his hands, but he didn't point it at us. He was just carrying his rifle by his side with no thought of shooting us. He came out screaming like a wild man. He must have known that if he screamed like that, that we would shoot. If he had come out quietly without a weapon with his hands up, we would have taken him prisoner. But we had to kill him. Then others came out. They came out one at a time, disorganized. We didn't encounter any organized resistance. They were like wild men running around with rifles and swords. They were announcing their presence. They knew it was the end. Their suicide. I guess they wanted to go to their happy hunting grounds. That's the way they were. Nobody could understand them. Unknown until decades later, it had been a top secret. I discovered that the exact moment that the Iwo Jima Marines were raising flags on Mount Suribachi, on the very next island, the island of Chichijima, 
a Marine pilot crashed landed in the water. On Chichijima were 25,000 troops. These Japanese watched the American crash and emerge from his plane. He did what an American would normally do. He swam ashore. He held his hands up. He surrendered. The Japanese soldiers watching this couldn't believe it. This American had just disgraced himself. He had surrendered. He lost his honor. And these Japanese were not hypocrites. They didn't think he should die only because he was an American. They weren't the type to kill a POW and later beg for their own lives. No, they were ready to die in the war and thought the American should be ready also. The Japanese knew that a soldier's duty was to die and never surrender. War, the Japanese knew, was about victory or death. During my five years of research for writing Flags of Our Fathers, I interviewed hundreds of American survivors of the Battle of Iwo Jima. In those five years, I met only four Japanese survivors of the battle. I had gone to college in Tokyo, and I had an office there for years. And one day as an adult, I sat in front of the director of the Japanese Iwo Jima Association. In our first meeting, he told me, Mr. Bradley, we have many members, but these are people who once served on Iwo Jima, but who had left the island before the battle. As you know, the Battle of Iwo Jima, almost everybody died on the Japanese side. There are few survivors. In Japan, we call our association the Iwo Jima Association to remember those who have gone, but we're sorry. We don't have any actual battle survivors to introduce to you. Well, this was Asia, so I drank tea and bade my time and for the next two years went to their meetings. Every time I was in Tokyo, I made contact with the Japanese Iwo Jima Association. I attended their meetings. I heard what they talked about. But there were no Iwo Jima battle survivors, nobody for me to interview. I often heard them say, Oh, Mr. Bradley, there are so few survivors. There's nobody for you to interview. One Tokyo morning, my phone rang. The Iwo Jima Association director said to me, We're having a luncheon meeting today. I said, Fine, I'll be there. Later, I sat at my place at the table. I ate the lunch that they put in front of me. I drank the tea. I was ready to listen to some of their talks for the next hour or so. And then somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, Mr. Bradley, you can now meet some Iwo Jima veterans. Four Iwo Jima veterans were in another room behind a closed door. Someone opened that door for me. I walked in, they closed the door, and I was standing with four Japanese veterans. And I can't explain why, but we all burst out crying. It wasn't crying like little kids. I was about 50 years old. They were all over 70 years old. I guess you have to read Flags of Our Fathers to understand how I felt at that time. There was just a kind of a whining, kind of a strong feeling. We were crying, but not bawling. We were just all emotionally looking at each other in the eye, and we couldn't get words out. There was just this feeling of, of tears that wanted to flow. I can't explain it. It's never happened to me before or since. And then each of them did something a little strange to someone looking from the outside, but I knew what they meant. They each pulled up their pants or pulled up their shirts to show me where they all had holes in their body. Their message was clear. They hadn't voluntarily surrendered. They were taken unconscious. They were almost dead. They had bullets in them. They weren't endorsing this behavior. These were Iwo Jima veterans who weren't saying that it was good that Japan had fought to the death, but they had been taught to die with their buddies. They were taught a code, and they were trying to tell me that they hadn't surrendered. They had followed their code to the end. August 6th, 1945, the city of Hiroshima. It's 8.16 a.m. 
One pound of uranium drops through the air six miles in 43 seconds. That atomic bomb detonated 1,900 feet above the Shima Hospital. The explosion created a blinding pulse of light for a tenth of a second. Tens of thousands died. When leaders in Tokyo heard what happened in Hiroshima, they dispatched a delegation of seven officials on a train to that bomb city. Their train entered an atomic wasteland. An officer stationed at Hiroshima ran up to the train to welcome the Tokyo contingent. He had a harlequin face. One half of his face was scorched, oozing red pus. The other half, unexposed to the bombs, was normal. He pointed to his face. He pointed to the bad side. He pointed to the good side. And then he said, everything which gets exposed gets burned, but anything which is covered escapes burns. Therefore, it cannot be said that we are defeated. My second book, Flyboys, is the story of eight American flyboys who were beheaded on the island of Chichijima. The ninth flyboy got away. His name was George Herbert Walker Bush. George Bush, the former head of the CIA, former president of the United States, didn't know these facts until I told them to him. Up until 2002, all of this had been classified. George Bush asked me to take him back to Chichijima, where he had been shot down. I had already been to Chichijima researching, and I had found Japanese soldiers who had seen George Bush crash into the ocean. And I asked them to come to Chichijima and wait for President Bush and I to helicopter over from Iwo Jima. George Bush flew in from the United States. He landed on Iwo Jima. There's a landing strip there. Chichijima is too mountainous. The Japanese military put us in a helicopter, and we choppered from Iwo Jima to next door Chichijima. The helicopter landed. I got out first with George Bush behind me. The Japanese soldiers were in front of us, ready to welcome George Bush. When George Bush came out of the helicopter, he was facing these soldiers that he had fought in World War II. There were about a thousand local people watching us. And in way of introduction, I said, well, President Bush, you were dropping bombs on these Japanese soldiers trying to kill them. Then I looked at the former Japanese soldiers and I said, guys, admit it. If you had gotten your hands on Bush, you would have chopped his head off. So let's have a beer. What can I say? Everybody chuckled a little bit and shook hands. Over the next two days, I saw these men interact. And I saw these guys who in World War II had hated each other when they were in their 20s. But now they were in their 80s and they embraced each other, and I saw them cry. I could see that the hatred between Japan and America in World War II was not genetic. George Bush no longer hated these guys. They no longer hated George Bush. They had been trained in a certain way to fight. In World War II, they were following their codes. Now that was all over. I'd like to end by relating a very powerful lesson I learned about the morality of war. In my book, Flyboys, I reveal the fate of these eight American flyboys who were beheaded on the island of Chichijima in World War II. This was thought to be so horrible at the time that the military made it all top secret and the families of these beheaded flyboys never learned their fate. It was a strange feeling to me when I read these details never revealed before that I knew what happened to these guys, but their mothers and fathers had gone to their graves not knowing what I now knew. So I had the job of informing the Flyboys families and friends about the last days of these Flyboys on the island of Chichijima. One day I called Joe Bond, who had served as a flyboy in the Pacific. 
Joe Bond was a former Philadelphia bartender, about 75 years old, a direct kind of guy who'd say, ah, that's the way it is, and how you doing? With the call to Joe Bond, I had a sensitive mission. Joe Bond's best friend in World War II had been Jimmy Dye. Jimmy Dye had been beheaded on the island of Chichijima. I knew what Joe Bond didn't know, and now I had to tell him. I found Joe's telephone number and phoned him one day. Hi, Mr. Bond, I said. This is James Bradley. I wrote the book Flags of Our Fathers. I have some information on Jimmy Dye. Joe Bond said, oh, Jimmy Dye? Oh, man, we were best friends. Joe Bond described his relationship with Jimmy from boot camp, through training, out on the aircraft carrier in the Pacific, and then flying together on dangerous missions. I interviewed Mr. Bond about what it was like to be a flyboy in World War II. He told me the straight facts. Joe Bond said, Ah, we'd strafe the Japanese if they were floating in the water. They were the enemy. I had no compassion for them. That's the way it was. Joe Bond recalled the day he and Jimmy were in separate planes bombing Chichijima. Joe saw Jimmy's plane go down. He saw Jimmy swim ashore. Joe had to fly back to the aircraft carrier. The last thing he knew about Jimmy was seeing his friend swimming on to Chichijima. Joe never knew another fact until I phoned him two generations later. I explained that Jimmy had survived but was beheaded on Chichijima. Joe Bond was silent for a few minutes and then he said, That's a hell of a thing. A few weeks later, I went to Japan and found a Mr. Tamamura in Yokohama who had walked Jimmy Dye to his death. Mr. Tamamura had been born in San Francisco. He spoke English better than I did. He had a rotary pin in his lapel. He had grown up in San Francisco, and in a long, convoluted story, he found himself living in Japan. He got caught up in the Imperial Japanese Army Gulag, and then found himself stationed on Chichijima. He had a rough captain, the guy who ordered Jimmy's beheading. Tamamura was taking care of Jimmy Dai, and there was nothing he could do. He was speaking English to Jimmy, trying to calm him. Jimmy didn't know he was going to be killed. Tamamura just said, you're going to sit down, and the officer's going to make a speech, and that'll be it. As Mr. Tamamura told me, I tried to calm Jimmy. That's all I could do. The big-chested officer got all his soldiers to surround Jimmy to witness the beheading. He pointed to Lieutenant Hayashi, and he said, You cut the neck of the prisoner. Hayashi was the runt of the litter. He had never handled a sword. He wasn't even a real soldier. He was a radio technician. The officer was making fun of this small Hayashi by saying, you cut Jimmy Dye's neck. Lieutenant Hayashi turned white. I can't do that. I never handled a sword. I can't kill the American. The officer said, you kill the American or we'll kill you. So this Hayashi is shaking. He takes the sword. He closes his eyes. He swings the sword. He does a bad job. He cuts Jimmy's neck, but it doesn't kill him. Then Hayashi lets go of the sword, turns away, vomits, and runs away crying. That was the Japanese army Bushido. Everybody watching was bummed out. Another soldier had to kill Jimmy. The Japanese soldiers weren't motivated by this. They walked away silently. It was demotivational. It wasn't human. It was not the real Japanese way. It was the corruption of Bushido. I interviewed Mr. Tamamura in Yokohama all morning and into the afternoon. He told me about Hayashi, but he said he didn't know how to contact Mr. Hayashi. Eventually, we said goodbye. It was about 4 p.m. when I got back to my hotel. I was jet-lagged. I closed the drapes to block out the sunshine. 
I lay down for a nap. I fell asleep, and then the phone rang. I looked at the clock. I realized that I had slept for just 40 minutes. It was Mr. Tamamura on the phone. He said, Would you like to speak to Hayashi? Mr. Hayashi spent seven years in prison for following the orders to kill Jimmy. Tamamura said to me, I just phoned Hayashi right now after I got home. I told him that he's got to speak with you. He was hesitant. Hayashi said to me, No, I'm not going to speak with Bradley. I don't speak to anybody about that time. Not even my children know. But Tom Amura said to him, You must speak to Bradley. I said to Mr. Tom Amura, Hey, Hayashi must be about 80 years old by now. His kids must be in their early 40s or 50s. Why is he going to speak to me when he hasn't even told his kids? Tom Amura answered, I told him your father had served on Iwo Jima and that you are a fair man. I told him just now that Bradley will write the story with or without you. Hayashi, this is the time for you to talk. So the next day I boarded a train and I was off to meet the man who cut Jimmy Dye's neck. I met Mr. Hayashi. He was a small, mild-mannered man. He was dressed in a blue suit, white shirt, and a red tie. I asked him repeatedly, Mr. Hayashi, you were forced to obey your officer's order. Don't you think seven years in prison was too much? No, he answered. He thought that his sentence was fair. Japan had lost the war. He had expected to die. America treated me well. At the end of our time together, I said, Mr. Hayashi, now you realize I'm an author. I've just written down everything you've told me. I'm going to put these facts in a book, and your children still don't know. Mr. Hayashi started to cry softly, and he said, My plan was to tell them before I die. Maybe they will find out from you. Mr. Bradley, please write a good book. When I returned back to the United States, I phoned Jimmy Dye's flyboy buddies to tell them what I had learned. I just laid it on the line. One day I was speaking with Joe Bond, who had seen Jimmy parachute off Chichijima. I wondered how he would react. I explained how Mr. Hayashi had unwillingly followed an order of his officer and that he had to follow that order or he would have been killed and that he spent seven years in prison for doing something that he did not want to do. After I told Joe Bond about Jimmy's last moments, there was a silence on the telephone, a long silence. Then Joe Bond finally said, That's a hell of a thing. We were both quiet for a few seconds more. Then I asked, What's a hell of a thing? Joe Bond said, Well, I don't think it was right to cut Jimmy's head off. Now it was my turn to be still. Of course, I could agree with Mr. Bond. But just days before, I had tears in my eyes as I listened to Mr. Hayashi, and I was torn. I took a chance and I said, Yes, Mr. Bond, but maybe the guys that you strafed with your bullets when they were helpless in the water thought that you had done a hell of a thing. Now there was an even longer silence. I wasn't sure if I had gone too far. Finally, Joe Bond said, Yeah, I guess it just matters what side you're on. I personally never fought in a war, but I will always remember what World War II veterans taught me. There is no morality in war. It just matters what side you're on. (laughs) ¶¶